So if we uh, consider, where's my, where's my uh, little set of atoms gone? Uh, where are my atoms gone? Oh, dear. Me. Everything. All oh, right. If at absolute zero all movement stops, does that include the orbit of electrons around the nucleus of an atom? No. That's a really, really good question because that embodies, I would argue, at least three modules worth, lecture modules worth of material to address that. That's a fantastic question. You're not going to take three modules worth to answer, are uh, you? Right? I might. <laughs> First of all, uh, at the absolute zero of temperature, you can't get there, but even if you could, and people can get down to very, very low temperatures, the electrons are still whizzing around. There are fluctuations uh, in, in particles, and uh, some are caused by thermal excitations, the, the, the temperature that you've just talked about, and some are just intrinsically quantum mechanical. They're just they're there in the system, and so even if you cool the system to absolute zero, which you can't, but if you could, then there'd still be the quantum fluctuations and I think therefore there could still be effectively orbits around uh, an atom. First of all you can't reach absolute zero and you can look at that two ways. You can look at that actually put aside all the quantum mechanics stuff and let's just look at the thermodynamics that was done centuries ago. There's something called the third law of thermodynamics. Loosely stated and I don't want to um, raise the ire of all the, the professional physicists out there, but loosely stated, what the third law tells us is that you can never, in a finite number of steps, you can never reach absolute zero. Uh, at high temperatures, the atoms are vibrating quite strongly about their equilibrium positions. These, we can regard these little bonds here as being like springs, and so the atoms are vibrating. And then as we cool down, these vibrations get less and less and less. But even as we approach absolute zero, we can never get rid of the zero-point energy motion. So the atoms will still have this... Uh, zero-point energy motion associated with, with, with quantum mechanics. At the quantum mechanical level, we have the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And the Heisenberg uncertainty pr principle tells us we can never precisely know the position of something, because if we know precisely the position of an electron, then we have a huge uncertainty in its momentum and thus a huge uncertainty in its energy, which means it could, in principle, have a, you know, a very, very large energy. Uh, according to quantum mechanics, again using Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, electrons are confined in a small space in the atom, uh, so-called Bohr radius, which is about 10 to the minus 10 meters. And again, according to the laws of quantum mechanics, if they're confined in that space, um, they're strongly confined and therefore there's an uncertainty in their momentum and velocity, so they certainly aren't at rest. Even at absolute zero, quantum mechanically, you still have vibration because you have a small amount of uncertainty about where the position of an electron or a nucleus or an atom is. If the universe is expanding slower than the speed of light, why hasn't the light from the Big Bang already passed us? You shouldn't, it's a mistake to think of the Big Bang happening at a particular place. The Big Bang happened everywhere, it's just at the time everywhere was very close together. And since then, everywhere has been flying apart from everywhere else. But of course, we were kind of in the middle of the Big Bang when it happened because we were one of the part of that everywhere. And so the explosion, the light that that explosion created was all around us then and has streamed away from us. But bits of the explosion that were not where we are uh, has been traveling towards us. And some of that's arrived. Some of that's already passed us. The Big Bang is, isn't, isn't at a, a fixed point in, the, in space, if you like. It's not that it happened there and it didn't happen everywhere else. Space and time are created from the Big Bang. So if you like, as the universe is expanding, it's always got a remnant of the Big Bang in it. And we can actually see it. It's this thing called the cosmic microwave background. Um, the cosmic microwave background is a very weak source of light. It's very wimpy sort of radio waves because the explosion has cooled down a lot just because of the expansion of the universe. Um, but we can still detect it. And in fact, you can see it for yourself. If you turn on your television, and it's not tuned to any particular channel, so you just see that fuzz on the screen, about 1% of the little fuzz that you see there, the apparent noise, is actually you, your television detecting uh, cosmic microwave background photons. So you can actually see the light from the Big Bang yourself. This is the beauty of looking out in astronomy. Uh, what, we're not only looking out at distances, we're looking back in time. And so you, one way of thinking about this, if you, if you imagine we're at a, the center of a, of a big sphere and, and the surface of that sphere is, is that blanket of radiation and it's just propagating to us and it's propagating from all directions. So, so now you can see that wh whichever direction you look, you're going to be able to see some remnant of this radiation. It, I mean, it does interact with each other 
and, it, and it, it, in some sense it does go past us, but it's co also coming from other directions. The, one of the most amazing things about this radiation, of course, is that it's so uniform. It's, it's a com almost completely uniform in temperature. That's showing that the universe is what is called isotropic. It looks the same in all directions. If I look out that direction far enough and look out in that direction far enough and can measure the temperature of the radiation coming back towards me, it's, it's almost the same. It's the differences between that radiation, once you've taken out certain effects like the fact that we're moving through the Milky Way and um, stuff like that, once you, once you take those out, those differences in those temperatures is, is, is only about 10 to the minus 4 degrees Kelvin. Are you good at sport? Well, I love playing cricket. <laughs> Not batting, but I always loved, loved bowling when I was a kid. I wasn't very good, but I did, I did enjoy, I get a lot of fun out of that, yeah. Making batsmen hurry a little bit, but I was never very good at it, but great fun. I used to be, I used to be. No, absolutely not. Woefully bad, terrible. Well, I think so. <laughs> I enjoy sports, certainly. I play football with all the boys and, and enjoy myself, and they haven't kicked me out yet, so I guess that's okay. <laughs> uh, I try. Is, I guess the short answer. Uh, I mean, uh, over the years, I've done various sports. I used to do quite a lot of judo. Uh, I used to be a, a goalkeeper for a five-a-side football team. I used to play football at my college as a goalkeeper, and I got this. This was kicked in by one of my defenders, so this eye has sunk and rotated round. Um, I actually think physical exercise is bad for you. You should keep away from it. Look at all the damage that's done with physical exercise with sports. Just keep away from it. If we didn't do it, we'd be much healthier. I used to play five-a-side football, and I've got a, a knee bandage on still because I ruptured the ligaments in my knee. But uh, unfortunately, sooner or later, it caught up with me, and I ended up falling awkwardly and tearing a whole bunch of ligaments, which kind of put an end to it. Am I good at sport? Um, I used to be. <laughs> I used to be a rower and I used to be a runner and I'm trying to become one again. Um, so yeah, I like sport. So uh, when nature tells you that you really can't walk around without a bandage, you give up the sports? I, I, I love sport and I would like to think I'm really good at it, but I'm not good enough to uh, have ever... Uh, I, I played at school and I played at university and I I represented my local town at swimming, and I had trials for Yorkshire at cricket. Uh, so I was all right, um, but I never, I never made it to the full uh, um, level of a professional in or anywhere near as good. I would have loved to have been, but no. My father, we lived in Wembley. My father bought two tickets for the World Cup in 1966, and he would go with either me or my brother-in-law, Ian. And uh, as it turns out, as my brother-in-law reminds me, uh, Ian didn't go to the cup final, I did. So I saw England win the World Cup.